Welcome to the first episode of Developing Talent, okay? I'm here with Orcs and Excoundrel, and you're going to see them every week at least once, all right? And even more if you catch them on NLC, which is what their lovely contrasting backgrounds are there for, you know? They have really high production value. Meanwhile, me, I just have, like, a TV that's not even mine and the fucking painting and stuff, all right? These guys go all out because their production is the highest quality, so check out NLC um, and check out these two guys on there. And we're going to do this every week. This week we're going to do NLC because it was kind of a last minute thing. Um, and I, because it's a last minute thing, whereas I have watched the VODs, I did rush watch the VODs. So I am actually going to rely on Orcs a lot more for this than I will on the other weeks, guys. So don't expect giga monologues like I normally will. But in next week's, we'll do French League, we'll do Spanish League, we'll do German League. I'll probably do a vote on Twitter after this show for you guys to say which league we do next. Um, and I'll try to get a guest for those. But these two will still be there. We'll just have like a fourth one as a guest. Um, and we're basically going to do this weekly. And I'm thinking of maybe expanding it to NA in the off season, or maybe even earlier than that at some point. Um, but yeah, so this is the first episode. Excoundrel's main job is to make sure that I don't keep ranting, which is something he's currently failing to do because this sentence just will not stop and I will veteran, never stop. Veteran. Let, there let's you get go. on to the first point, hey? There let's you go. The first point. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, cool. So what, what? You, you go first. You go first. No, I, I, we'll I was going to say, so veteran, like, obviously we've had two weeks in the ALC so far. Yeah. Um, there's been some interesting games, I'd say. <laughs> But out of the outset, from the games that you've watched, which team do you think is the best? Which team do you think has come in as the best team overall? As the best team overall? So the, so the immediate thing that I always look at when I'm looking at the ERLs, unless there's some sort of jungle support geo that I think is just controlling the map in a way no one else is going to be able to compete with, then the immediate thing that I look at is early game systems and team fighting. Um, and in early game systems, that's easier to fix than team fighting ever will be, right? Mm. Um, the best team fighting team right now in the NLC, uh, in my opinion, is Fnatic Rising. Uh, not sure if you guys are going to agree on that. They're better than BTXL at that, but BTXL have better early game setups. There are actually a lot of gaps in Fnatic Rising's early game that I think are probably what dropped them um, last split. Um, and probably would end up being the issue again. Uh, in terms of kind of new players that come in and fit this whole area of their team fighting's already really good, so they're in like a really good start. Um, Tibor from Galaxy Racers actually doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. Ericsson's mm -hmm. doing really well. And I think the team that has um, like the best shot would actually be Nordavind overall at becoming like a super top team because I think all mm. of their carry positions I think Kerberos, uh, Ericsson and Chrisberg are all really good but their jungle yeah, supports are like cheesy as fuck they're not like <laughs> technically <laughs> and they're not fundamentally insane but they're cheesy as fuck but that's fine because you get those carries ahead they are actually going to carry every fight um, so that's something that they can rely on, and it's way easier to develop their jungle support there than anything else. Like, their support plays like an absolute ape, and that's good, because getting the ape to calm down is much easier than getting the ape to speed up, you know? So, that's my opinion right now. Sure. Okay. Do you want what to about you, you, Orcs, yeah, you go. You, you guys are the, are the analysts here, so your yeah, Europeans I... come in as, as higher, higher tier than mine. I agree with, like, the Fnatic... Um, BTXL point. I think BTXL showed that their team fighting can be a bit lacking even in, in the start of the split. Like we actually saw them drop a game um against Granite, where really it just came down to the team fighting where they were getting out executed on. And I feel like there's a lot of teams in the league who sort of like focus in on that team fighting aspect. And I think that BTXL tend to be a team who play more for the skirmishes and for that early uh, momentum. I think that jungle support duo is decent, but I I'd agree I don't think it's like dominate the entire map level um interesting on the nordvin one i think nordvin like i was watching their games i don't think there's i don't think there's like a ton to go on based on their games because i feel like you know they a couple of the, like one of their games i feel like galaxy race had a really a bit of an in draft i think two of their games were against like lower ranked teams i think all around they looked like a pretty well-rounded team and i didn't have like many particular complaints but i didn't see them as to stand out so i'd be interested in hearing what specifically you saw that made you sort of feel that way i mean 
it feels to me like when they end up in team fights, um, particularly on Chrisberg's side, I think Chrisberg always understands the windows in which he can play to his absolute limits. Like he's doing things from the AD carry role that I think most AD carries aren't attempting to do, and most AD carries will kind of sit back and wait for a more guaranteed opportunity to go in. But this guy goes in in situations where other people don't realize it's not even a trade, it's just definitely a one for oh. This is a bit more to the, to the speaking to the sense of, I guess, AD in general in the region, but like on the, on the flip side of Chrisberg would be, um, I, I'm gonna butcher this guy's name, by the way. I'm sorry, I'm sorry in advance, but like. Den Voxny? I'm not sure how M- I pronounce yeah. that. Voxny. Den Voxny. Yeah, so I like him a lot, but he definitely is much more of like a safe uh, fighter initially in fights. He won't be the guy doing like the the entry frag, I guess you could say, into fights. Whereas Chrisberg is, which is something that someone in the LEC like Neon does, which is something that I quite highly value, or Niski is currently doing on Lucian, right? Um, obviously not an AD carry, but might as well be at this point. Um, Dem, Dem Voxne? Is, am, I, am I doing that right again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so he, he, he will go really aggressive when the fight is won, um, but he'll make sure that he doesn't lose the fight first. I still think he's looking really, really good, but there's like that extra level that Chris Berg's He, he doesn't for, take like. the risk. Like, Dem Voxne yeah. doesn't take the yeah. risk. Like, he, he, yeah. he'll, he'll take the 100% play yeah. rather than the coin flip. And Eric's saying... You know, and look, you hit, him, you hit the nail on the head there, veteran, because he's, he's <laughs> his roots are a Caitlyn one trick. <laughs> so the, the, there the you go. There you come, go. The guy's roots come from Caitlin, but no, he's he honestly, I rate, I rate, I've always rated Den Voxney. Actually, I think he's he's a good up and comer. I've got an interesting question for you though, because you mentioned Chris Berg a lot, mm-hmm. and Chris Berg has like permanently, in my eyes, been the best AD carry in the Nordics, like just running that scene. Like, sure. Why is why has he never found the next step? Is it is it? A, do you think it's a personal decision? I mean, obviously, we can't speak to Chris Berg's personal decisions, but. Like, oh. it, it feels like he's never found the next step, you know? But ADC in the ERLs is so good, by the way. And ADC yeah, in true. the LEC is really good as well. So the ADs in the ERLs also don't really have a good shot up, right? Like, x and Deadly are the two that I would um, immediately think of as being, like, next step up. Which, both mm-hmm. are British, right? But but legit, they are actually both insane. Um, but I don't see a team that they could go in. Even people who just got rejected from LEC, like Comp, I think, still deserve an LEC spot, right? And then after that, you get to people like um, Jack Spectra, who I think is like a really strong up-and-comer. And then when I'm thinking of like new blood coming in, I think of like Nata in the Spanish League, right? Like you mm-hmm. have... But, but, but there are so many names of ADs, right? That it's difficult for someone like Chris Berg to differentiate themselves overall unless he like goes to the EU, EU Masters and Smurfs, which he hasn't had the opportunity to do yet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned BTXL's early game as well, because we had an interview with Hattrix on the NLC, oh. and he basically said, um, we we are trying to have an early game this split, because oh, last good. split, and hey, no, 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 you were right. Like, um, <laughs> And last split, we basically, and all the way that we played through the European Masters was like, we just, we like, we wait it out, and then we get to late game, and we try and team fight it, and you know we win, try and win through like what we felt we felt was our superior team fighting, and, and to, specifically to XL, they, they usually had like really good late game shot calling. There was so many games that XL have won, like by just going for a, some sort of backdoor attempt. There was there was a, there was a game this split in the NLC where XL should yeah, have tough, absolutely yeah. turbo sprinted it, and they won because they set up like a. Uh, a, a four minute in advance top lane push where they constantly pushed the top lane wave and then went for a backdoor attempt on soul point like when the soul was up for grabs um so like their late game decision making has been really good but he specifically said in an interview like we, we're trying to like why we're kind of looking like we're sprinting it a bit sometimes is because we're trying to have a better early game we're trying to be more proactive mm-hmm. and we're playing you know we're playing to not just get to the late game and win so he said that we felt like but when we played against k-corp the wake-up call was that we fucking sucked in the early game like like versus K Cop, they just rolled us for yeah. the most part in the early game. But K Cop so did we that like, to everyone. They well, to yeah, K Cop a K Cop, right? But but for XL to get to the finals and then to just get rolled that hard, they were like, ah, okay, right, we 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 need to sort our shit out in the early game. So they they basically, I think, they've come into this split, yeah. and it might look like in some of their games that they're sprinting it a little bit, but it's because I think they're trying to evolve as a team here, and I think that like this early start of the NLC is because they're trying to evolve as a team. Um, and not just rely on their late game decision making and their late game team fighting to actually get those wins, which is I think what they were kind of relying on a little bit last time. That explains a couple of things then, because Markoon's being a lot more proactive now than he was mm. before. Um, and Markoon was, for me, a guy who got a lot of hype from players who played with him in solo queue, right? But 
when it came to competitive, I never really saw anything that impressive from him. Particularly when it came to his early parving, there were a lot of holes. There are a lot less holes now. There's still some. Like, they didn't seem to understand, though every team, even at a fucking world level, falls into this trap these days, didn't seem to quite understand when Aroma needs, wave, needs waves pinged or not. It was Aroma was on Jace, I believe, on that game, um, and it was really starting to trigger me, to be honest. Um, but he, he, he is working well to at least make sure that he can trade for Aroma safely, and they can essentially start playing two sides of the map on that, which is not something I'd expect from Markun before. And Advian... Um, because honestly, jungle support systems are the differentiating factor between like a really good early game team and not like G G2 Arctic last split taught us that because their laners have a really good early game systems, but then they reach a UM and Coldo's just sprinting into enemy jungle looking to die at every opportunity. So this is the area you need to go. And Advian is a guy who's also growing on me a lot more now, and especially in his performances in the last few weeks. I think he's finding a really good engagements. I think they're playing really well with those engagements. Um, but Advian for me was much more of a coin flip player before, and now he seems to be a lot more controlled on it and it makes a lot more sense relative to like the map whereas beforehand it seemed to me like he only saw like the two people that were there right now or the three or the four people that were there right now and didn't consider the rest so i think they're improving and if they keep improving then they won't be reliant on hat tricks picking mal zahar or galio and you know just roaming bottom flipping it and roaming top and flipping it because yeah if you meet another k corp or k corp themselves then that won't cut it right I, I, yeah, I agree. I, I think Orcs. The question, the, the interesting about hat tricks is that he's also trying. I think trying to show more of the old hat tricks because I think hat tricks kind of got, especially when he came into XL, he kind of got boxed into like this. Uh, he, he's he's a role playing mid. He like he like fits what the team needs. Plays control mages, like you said. Plays Galios. Plays Malzahars. Plays like for for, for 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 impacting other lanes more so than anything. But from this split. We've kind of seen hat tricks, I think, go back to the older style of hat tricks, which is like playing the Akalis, playing the Yones, trying to be a little bit more proactive, which has been a bit hit or miss, but but has is obviously showing that he's also attempting to do something. Because as we've seen from the LEC, like having a proactive and individual style mid laner is like a key right now, and and hat tricks is I think stepping up to do that as well because for for the entire spring split he was almost always a role playing mid like he just fit a, a role that the team needed and most of that was like playing galio and playing utility focused mid laners um yeah i think i think it's kind of a problem i've seen with a couple of other teams in the nlc where like their mid laners are kind of leaning heavily on mages and i feel like there's a lot of power being able to pick these more gamers heavy champs when you know you have like akali the lee sin he's just like renekton mid and he's been leaning more into that and things like diego it definitely feels like he's, you know, I feel like XL as a whole has kind of looked like this a bit, but it feels like he's specifically very much like limit testing. There's definitely times where he goes to plays where, you know, it's a skill check and there are times where he loses that skill check. So in terms of like, you know, looking at optimal play, I don't, I don't think it's like there, but like it definitely feels like they're looking to try and develop, which I think is a, a good use of the time in the NLC. Because I think mm. a lot of the time, you know, we, we've we seen scenarios where BTXL have clean swept and like the UKLC before that had like overwhelming victories but it really didn't matter in the long term so i think them trying to sort of define a style early on and uh shift their systems towards that is is definitely a good thing so when i do see mm. some games like the one against dusty uh i'm kind of like okay you know <laughs> you won in the end it was really questionable but uh i guess you're trying new things i mean if they model themselves off like old fpx i think that would be really good for them Right, because I I do think I kind of agree with you that hat tricks when he's like skill checked isn't necessarily winning those. I don't view hat tricks yeah. as that kind of like carry mid laner in his own right, but I do view him as a guy who is very critical for getting his team ahead right now, and then deadly carries mm -hmm. all of the fights. Or if a is on a split pusher, a Roma will start pulling out so much pressure on the map that the team just has to respond. I think Hattrix is really good for his teams for that. And if jungle yep. support play around enabling that and playing with that, then I think the, that team would have its own system. They wouldn't be K-Corp, um, but they would be like their own version of an early game system that could definitely compete with K-Corps, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I, Arome's been turbo smurfing it, by the way. That, that, I mean, that guy's a monster compared to most of the mids in the NL, in the NL, so tops in the NLC. Um, I mean, you'd expect it, right? I think Arome's still a good player. Yeah. Um, and I also think from from his interviews, his mentality is really good. Um, I've always drawn the, the drawn the, the the major comparison between Arome and Fadiven, 
when you talk to them in interviews and you, you look at their mentality, Aromo's mentality has been, look, I'm here for a reason. I'm, I'm back in ERLs for a reason. I, I, I want to, A, find my love for the game again and B, prove myself again. Um, whereas whenever I've like listened to Forbidden, it's always been a bit like, I feel like I'm better than this kind of thing um <laughs> the so, man solo kill faker right before it was cool <laughs> and true true before it was cool before it was cool um but uh, I'm, I'm putting words in febby's mouth obviously I, I don't know for sure but i think it's just the way that it's come over in interviews arome has got a really strong mentality when it when it comes to like trying to claw his way back from this level um and he has yeah. kind of styled them most tops in the nlc he really has and did he i mean he kind of styled on adam in the in the european masters finals yeah he did um, i mean on the yeah, solo so. level he 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 was way better than adam in the in the eom finals i do think yeah. that sometimes aroma gets a lot more praise than he should in some instances like i remember the renekton game in the eom last year that was sure. really quite confusing to me but i thought like in the jace game I, i'm quite glad you said that he's like playing a cut above because i was worried that on the basis of stuff like the jace game that he played this very recent weekend that I'd have to be defending him. Um, but luckily it's kind of recognised that that kind of stuff's not on him. Because I think he is playing really, really, really well. Um, and he deserves a leg up. And I think he is somewhat too good for this. And we are a region that's kind of bleeding tops right now. So when someone like Aroma comes along, I think that does deserve to be highlighted. Yeah, I think he's really good. And uh, it's, it, you made an interesting point about hat tricks. Because do you remember the old Excel with Taxa? Um, yes. I kind I kind yeah. of feel like Hattrick plays a similar role to Taxa, but in mid. Like yeah. Taxa would yeah. sacrifice his own play to get his lanes ahead, but it would often make Taxa look a little worse if you weren't as trained in looking at what was what was important. Um, and Taxa like was very much like I would hang around. He would hang around a lane for pressure, right? He would just sit there for pressure, even if he wasn't going to gank. He'd, he'd he'd sit there to try and give his lane as a bit of uh, a bit of an edge when it comes to whatever. But I feel like Hattrick not is is half that like he, he, he's not quite tax the level of i give up my jungle or give up my game for my lanes but he does play to accelerate his team more than anything else um but you know when you've got someone like deadly when you've got someone like arome like and i think marcoon is way more carry orientated than tax there ever was um i feel like that's not a bad thing for excel like you said it's, it's like their style that they could work on i mean i think tax is someone who's good at playing for his lanes and like supporting them like the recent meta doesn't suit him as much, but I think him on tricked, like I think Denvox and Paulson, like the mid and AD on that team are really solid. And I think it's a it's a roster that suits him more than as you said, like old XL. Yeah. I mean I remember like when I was playing with Tax, like the summary was like he would just like pin a camp bot until an axe was fed. And I feel like his play style obviously has shifted a bit over the years as like mans have shifted, but I feel like that's where he's really served best. Uh, and I think as as you're talking about, like I think Den Vox Nays look good. I think Paulson's also looked good in that roster, and I think he's I like, like a good enabler for. Yeah. I I actually think on 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 tricks, the guy that I was, the guy that I was really focusing on on tricks was uh, was Madly. Um, first, I thought that Taxa understood when he had a particular win condition he had to go for over and over again really well. But I thought that Madly was so phenomenal whenever he came in on team fights. Um, that I really wish they would just fix his resets so that he's actually there at the start of them because there were so many fights where he'd come in and do something decisive but the whole situation would probably have been avoided if they made sure that they played with him more towards the start of it but very often this guy's resets were just off compared to the rest of his team and it didn't feel like they were all on the right page but if that team starts playing as five I think that they start performing like so much better to be honest um, I think Madly might go under the radar a bit but this is a guy that definitely his team fighting was really good to me and that's always like the best starting point because that's the hardest thing possible to coach right yeah i remember the, specifically the, the gragas go game ops, go ops. i remember specifically the gragas game being a really mm. big one for him because i feel like yes. that yeah. game wasn't necessarily an easy one to win but like he came in with this like massive flank when yeah. i think they were against resolve resolve the push too far and like the the top blue side jungle and he just came behind them and like it looked like initially Resolver doing okay, and then they just got absolutely stomped. And then, like, throughout that game, it felt like any fight was just, like, task, someone's someone's now knocked into their team dead, and it's, like, fight's over. You know, you're playing a 4v5. Yeah, like, he, he would he would split the team, and they would always collapse on the flank really well. And even when enemy team was split, they were really good at collapsing on flank. But he just, mm. he just created that scenario for them every time. And he seemed to understand exactly what he was doing there. He just doesn't, just on map play, he doesn't work with the team enough to be that you know, pivotal point of them. And I think if, if they if they focus on giving him that more, then I think that team suddenly starts looking really good. I mean, I'm actually really excited about the next game they've got because it is versus XL. 
So like Oof. the next match that Tricked have got is versus XL. And I think that's because I think Tricked have looked really good in early. Like the early Tricked's early has been pretty solid. They've managed to like really accelerate leads. Um, so that matchup is on Tuesday um, at nine o'clock CEST. So if you if you want to watch of a match that I think is going to be really, really good next week, the Tricked versus BTXL match, I think it's going to be insane. Mm. I'd actually be in interested, speaking of top laners, like uh, someone who I actually rate whose team has not been doing too great is is Zombie on Dusty. Uh, like watching of his games, I feel like he pulls his weight pretty heavily. A lot of times where he's finding solo kills in the lane, or even if he's not finding solo kills, there's scenarios where like he's avoiding dives or like freezing on his opponents and getting a pretty sizable lead. But like the main thing is like even in team fights, even though this is, you know, on Dusty who have lost every game so far, although they have that close one against XL, I felt like in team fights, he had a role to do, and like every time he was like on top of that role. Like I remember that game against Tricked. Like, even though they lost the game, every team fight he was just smashing Paulson's head into the ground, <laughs> and it felt like a really consistent thing. I think his Paulson was on Lucian. Paulson was pretty fed. Pretty sure had Gale Force as well, and this set would just smash his face in the ground every fight. Even like they lose the fight, and you just see Zombie running away, and it's like okay, three kills for Tricked, but Zombie managed to basically solo kill. Paulson, so I actually really rate him, and it's you know a bit tragic that they're currently zero. I think they're zero four at the moment, uh, zero five actually. Yeah, I, I think he's been doing a great job. So just talking about like top laners who've been uh, team fighting well. I was wondering if you'd sort of seen much of him. I hadn't actually considered uh, Zombie to be honest, but I think you are right. Um, but I can't really comment too much because honestly, his game, I'm drawing a, a blank on a lot of his individual stuff. I f I think of M Test more when I think of Dusty. Because um, I thought M Test was at least doing fine uh, in their games, but it wasn't anything like super notable. The team is kind of in the dumps right now. Um, yeah, I they, do, they, they need yeah. to buck themselves up a little bit. I do prefer it when top laners do recognize that their best role in the game is to be as annoying as humanly possible. Like, once you enter that mindset, you become a true fucking top laner. Um, which is why I liked what Madly was doing so much, and also why I like what um, Kerberos was doing so much. Um, like I think, ev like, again, I think all the carries of Nordavind are actually really fucking good for their team. And the problem is mm. that it's best when he's being as annoying as possible. And you can be annoying as a split push, and you can be annoying as disrupting their backline. Like even if he's just going into suicide on my neck, and then he he's still being really fucking annoying, right? So, so I've got I've got a team that I know that you're going to be interested to talk about, a veteran um, Galaxy Racer. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna set the scene, okay? Summer 2019, vet European Masters. Veterans sold me a name. Um, <laughs> that name wasn't Monk, wasn't Wendell Boy, wasn't Tibor, it wasn't Kakan, it was Jakey. Um, Monk sold me Jakey as the next up and coming jungler. Um, and I actually think he had a good European Masters 2019, by the mm. way. I think his his team kind of sprinted it a little bit, but he as an individual jungler looked pretty solid. Mm. Galaxy Racer are an interesting team because I think jakey has been okay, but I really think the talking point for me has been Tibor. I I think Tibor has been a re I've, I've actually and I might be completely I've never heard of this guy before before he came to NLC. I don't know what his history is. I'm sure you might have a bit more insight there, veteran. Um, but he's really impressed me on Galaxy Racer, and actually the team is looking like borderline, con you know, competing for top four right now. Like I think this is a team that if again if they get it right they'll really get it right so okay so all right there, there are there are like two kind of three things you asked me there all right so the the, the first thing i, I, I want to clarify like this rod, so i'm gonna go for it <laughs> the first thing i want to clarify is i'm really high on jakey for the same reason i was really high on shinkov and the aspects that i criticize shinkov uh for um which people at like my discord parties and stuff will remember is that once we get past the early game and the early to mid transition phase you get to the point where we start having to team fight and more often than not Shinkov will like miss mischaracterize if, if it was a good time to go in or not and he'll just drop all his hp before the fight's even really being allowed to occur or something this would happen with him this could even happen with target mass sometimes the things that were really good about them was their control of early game the thing that gets people's heads turning is when you do just start dominating all of these fights, which Shinkrov wasn't ever really going to do, even though I think he's like the most vital part of K-Corp and the reason why even XL would have to say like that they ended up losing the finals or him and x -Matty. Um Jakey is in a similar place, and I think that the way that he was playing the map, um, even in the games that they were losing, was really fucking good in the early phases. And at the same time, he'd walk up, 
be about get about to be CC to hell and just not Morgana shield himself, right? Like that kind of thing doesn't contradict the things I really value about Jakey, which means that if you pair Jakey up with what Shinkov has, which is like really good and sometimes very aggressive carry players, then uh, then that team will be best fit to succeed. And Tibor has been that player, right? Jakey's job is to make sure that the, that the game isn't lost before Tibor can start doing shit, right? And Tibor's doing shit in lane, he's doing shit in fights, right? He's doing shit everywhere. I just want to clarify, I'm saying doing shit as being doing stuff, not a shit. <laughs> but, so I... I, I, I also was really impressed when Jakey recognized in that same Morgana game that bot is just turbo lost. Because um, you're right, I didn't try to sell you on Wendell, right? Um, and just hammered on, on on top mid as much as he possibly could and kept up in economy on jungle because that gave them their fighting chance, right? Now, obviously, that in and of itself won't be enough and Jakey won't be able to fucking faker all of the fights later. That's not what I praise him for, right? <laughs> but if we can get past those kinds of ints, right, then we'll be then we'll be in a really good position. Tibor will be a big part of that. I was actually really impressed with Tibor and didn't expect to be. Um, similar to when I remember um, Legions was coming in, um, and I didn't expect to be impressed by him on the team, but I was really impressed by him on the initial week. Um, this guy... So, first off, I think it's a really good meta for him. Um, it's a really good meta for anyone who's not really good on mages, so I'm sorry, Hatrix. Um... Majors are just in a really terrible place right now. And when it comes to, you know, when it comes to Yasuo, Tibor is really good and he understands his windows really well. Ericsson's also um, benefiting from this, I've noticed. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens when the meta changes. But right now he is the level of aggression that is needed and he's such, going to be such a distraction in melee range for them that Monk might be able to not die in all of these fights and output enough damage, right? Which is good, because you can't necessarily rely on Wendell doing the job there, judging by the last game that they played. So, that's currently my thoughts on both of those players. Well, three of those players, I guess. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm interested to get Orcs's take on this. Um, but I don't really see... Like, I, 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 see, I see that team kind of behaving how I figured it would. Just the focal point of, of the carry potential is definitely different, right? Like, Tibor, Tibor is clearly really good. Um, and he's really good in all of these fights, and he was actually really good early on. Um, like, he was one of the only people that wasn't, like, going super ham and deciding I must go for second wave crash on Lucian indiscriminately, right? Like, on those early game systems, he does actually seem to understand what he is doing. Um, so it's not as simple as this guy just plays fights well. This guy clearly has some level of knowledge that isn't necessarily typical. Like, I saw Pride messing up on this kind of stuff, and this guy's been here for ages. So I, I have high hopes for Tibor even when we get past this meta because those systems matter so much more when we get to other metas other than the one we're on now. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, th I think Tibor's looked good and I think, again, it, it hasn't just been the sort of team fight and I think Jakey has facilitated him well, but I think it's, it's just kind of... I feel like it's hard to sort of... Um, because when you have these good early game systems in place, it's kind of hard because bot lane has just been such a... Yeah, I mean, the, it's... it's So things are... things think The things that are going wrong in bot lane are positioning based. Um, these guys aren't playing with each other enough and they're giving too many windows for their opponents to be able to get in. Um, and oddly enough, it's not Monk completely sprinting it on all of these ones either. I don't want to go like full ham and flame Wendell, but like I could like, I could I could also throw some flame on Prosper because I actually had to sit through that karma game. Alright? So if I had oh to sit my... through that you have to sit through my memory. <laughs> oh, of that. No, no, all right? I, <laughs> I remember writing down Oh mm. I remember writing down um what's it called? Yeah, Prosper's the worst level one in the entire league. Jesus. Like, I remember there was like three games out of four like, they just got engaged on bot lane, and he either died or he burnt summoners. And I'm just like, what is going oh, mate, that on, thresh, honestly? That Thresh into Leona game? The, yeah, there's that one. There's the oh. Karma one. I'm pretty sure there was another Karma one. And it's just like, okay, guys, that's I mean, it's amazing that they still managed to okay, win the were, games. But the, like, we, go, yeah, go, go on, go on. I, I mean, there were I, two really, really tense moments, okay, in NLC last weekend, all right? And one was when Monk was walking past Drake Pit like three times yep. 
with sharp and um oh, fuck. I'm sorry, I'm so bad. With oh, is that where he was just walking, sharp and walking back yes, and forth? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that yeah. was so tense. <laughs> and the next one was when I realised Prosper thinks that standing over here is a good idea. It's like, oh my god, there has to be a plan here. <laughs> Those were the two most tense moments. That's another link between Galaxy Racer and Prosper, other than the ending support aspect of it. A lot of, a lot of limit testing. I also thought the, the great moment for me was that um, the early 2v2 between Galaxy Race and Fnatic, but like Monk just like rocket jumped in the melee range of Leona, trying to take the fight, and he, he lived. Yeah. He actually lived it. He managed to get out. But then, and the then Nautilus. See... Yeah. <laughs> Wendell just like running under tower, like I'm committing. I'm 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 getting this kill or I'm dying trying. I mean, there's been a lot of limit testing, so you know. You guys are an entertaining bot lane. All right. But, oh. like, well, but but imagine if it works. Imagine if they just keep going for this stuff, and eventually they they've just downloaded all of their limits, and it just works, right? Then they exactly. have that, and they have Tebow, and they have Jakey, right? And their top laner is doing fine. Right, and he, they're even able to play around him when things go on fire on the other side. We know that now. That guy's being practiced on this right now. Like it could be a good team. Plus, may maybe I mean we saw it. Do you remember Misfits against T1 years ago? Like maybe when you're against a really good team, you just coin flip at level two, <laughs> and if it works, maybe you win. If it fails, well, you know, maybe it was doomed anyway. Hey, the, that, the, that the more so I strategy. the more I watch Hans Sammer, the more I'm convinced that everything there was just perfectly calculated. <laughs> this guy is just <laughs> way too good now at knowing He's when to be aggressive. So, and I think eventually one, one person we've kind of I think one person we've kind of glossed over in Galaxy Racer is Kakan. Yeah. Um, I, I actually think he's. Like, Kakan hasn't really played the same meta as everyone else in the top plane. He's still, still kind of stuck in tank duty meta. Um, but he has played that role well for Galaxy Racer. Um, he's held his own. He had, he had a really good moment where he... Okay, who was it where they tower dived and got... He double killed them on bloody Orn early game. Um, that was oh, last I, week. I remember that. I can't remember who it was who dived it, him. They, the, the people who dived him were inting the hell out of it. But, but like, Kakan has been a relatively decent t you know, tank role player for Galaxy Racer. Um, and I think with the volatility of the rest of the map, it, it is quite nice to have someone that is stable like Kakan, to be honest with you. It, is. it was Kova. It was Kova who attempted. It was simply and Tatui who attempted the the dive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Against Khan. I mean, I I just need to see more games from him, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like for with a lot of these players, it's gonna be that. Um, but right now, what I've seen doesn't make me write him off, and what I've seen actually makes me feel like he could be good. Um, because again, like it's not just being about that he can be like consistent or something. They did have to play acceleration around him once, and and. And it did work, right? They didn't win yeah. the game. But they know that they can do that now. Right? So Yeah, I'm hopeful for I'm hopeful for this team. I am. Yeah. Despite if if, if bot lane can keep it together, I think the mid jungle <laughs> I think the mid jungle is really strong. I think mm. Jakey and, and Tebow is really strong. Even though as you said it's not massively about mid jungle right now, it's more about support jungle, but I think Jakey and Tebow are really good players and I think are kind of solid and consistent. It's just keeping that because because monk is either insane like he's had some games where he is like single-handedly turbo smurfed it and then there is some games where they've kind of sprinted it yeah um, and i will i will i will add that it's not necessarily support jungle in the erls it will be at the very top and if you have a strong support jungle it's game over that's historically mm. always been the case right um but I think they can get away without their support jungle playing map insanely. I think if Wendell Burr and Monk just get past their 2v2 issues, I think already this team is competing to, to go to EU yeah. Masters. They need I to agree. do the extra thing to win it, right? Which is, we're talking about Galaxy Racer EU winning EU Masters now. We're way far off in the future. Let's maybe <laughs> not. Let's go baby steps, right? Let's go baby <laughs> steps. they got to win the NLC first, or yeah. at least get to finals. Yeah. Um, oh, all right. I, I kind of want to revisit Nordavin though, because that's a team that you seemed really hyped on, and it's a team that's outside of those academy teams. I will, t we will talk about Fnatic a little later on, by the way. Um, but Nordavin is something that, you know, as you mentioned, is I think I think I've always said, and I've said it quite a lot on broadcast. I think Nordavin is the best possible team outside of the two academy teams mm. that has the chance to win the NLC. Mm. Um, okay, good. Because they, Ericsson is good chris Berg is consistently good i mean as you said ad carry is an incredibly competitive role in eu but chris Berg's definitely in the mix mm -hmm. at one of the top ends 
I, I've loved Kerb Ross ever since I started casting him years ago. Um, he's he's definitely a, a more... And I, I like how aggressive and how, like, willing to take, like, 1v1 and skill checks in top lane, which you don't yes. usually see from a lot of top laners. Um, and win a lot And as you mentioned... Them. Yeah. It's I, like Wendell okay. is willing to take skill checks, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't... I I mean, I, I think the, the commentary that we've had on Touch, or, or the commentary that we've, we've kind of had from Touch is when he's not playing Alistair, he's kind of sprinting it a little bit. Um, but I don't, I'm not, you know, skilled enough to like know the ins and outs of what makes a good support right now. Uh, and Sharps look decent to me, but of course, like you mentioned that that's, those are two, the two are maybe the, 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 the two areas that if they improved would really accelerate yeah. this roster. I think Go on. for me, just to comment on touch, I think like when he first joined the league, I was pretty underwhelmed. And I feel like even when he was on Alistair, there's some games where I was like, kind of i just feel like you they're, they're like missing stuff mechanically some over aggressive gauges i think he's improved a lot over that time like uh i think that there's a there's a lot less scenarios where he's just like making kind of big mistakes and i feel like it's kind of because originally he was on like their academy team and then he got bumped up and i think like maybe it was just like an initial thing but there was definitely a period of time where i agree like there was a lot of in from him but i think he's sort of like merged better with the team and he's not mm. sort of making those same question mark plays I think a lot of As it much. is also that they're kind of comping around this guy's going to go in. These guys aren't playing like low mobility champions anymore. And it's like Nordavin's Hillis thing. Yes. That, that's actually a good comparison, by the way. Like his Leona game was legit just full fucking Hillis thing. Like I see them. I'm pretty sure you guys are vaguely on my screen somewhere. I'm going in. Right. So I don't Oh, when it, when it, when it comes to Alistair, Alistair's just not in that good a place right now. Um, so I put a lot of stuff on that, but I think this guy's tendencies on a peak Alistair would probably serve better on an Alistair because you have other ways around that kind of a discrepancy with your teammates, mm -hmm. right? If you're not playing perfectly power level with them on Alistair, that's fine. You have ways to get that guy into your team, right? You have way you have more ways to lock them in for a longer period of time than you do with Leona. Obviously, you can combo stuff on Leona to to, to stun them for fucking ever, but there's there's a limit to that. Whereas with Alistair, there isn't really a limit to that. Um, I think the biggest thing about Sharp is I still think this guy just kind of falls into modes and doesn't see the map in a complete way. Like, I, I, I still think there, there are times where this guy's just clearing when there are quite obvious options on the map that would be better for him to do at that point. And there are times where he does see the obvious uh, stuff on the map, but it feels like he kind of, like, arbitrarily switches these modes and it kind of depends on, I'm not quite sure it depends on, maybe if his teammates point out something or not. Um, I do wonder when I see stuff like them waiting for Monk for fucking ever, right? If that was Touch saying, I think we can make a pick here, and them all leaning on making that pick, right? Because that right there is them trying to make a play, but not necessarily being efficient in other things. Is there really nothing better to do here? Like, it's That, 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 that kind of thing is, is weird, but when you have carries that play to the effectiveness that Ericsson, Chrisberg, and even Kerberos have been doing, that kind of thing can be fine because you can just snowball games off of those kinds of picks, you know? What what, what does Nordavind need to do to like level up then? Like if you were if Nordavind were going to beat BTXL and Fnatic, who are clearly the like let's not beat around the bush, they're clearly the two main competitors yeah, in the yeah. entire league right now. Like what did, what what do you want to what does Nordavind need to do to hit that level and maybe even surpass it? Because I would even argue that some of the the solo laners on Nordavind would probably be better than some of their counterparts on, on some of those teams. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a lot on Sharp's improvement more than on Touch's. I think touch uh, Touch's level can be made up for by if you are already ahead at that point. Then I honestly mm -hmm. think you're fine with Touch playing as much of an ape as he is, right? Um, so long as there, there are bananas for all, it's fine. Uh, so I think a lot of it's going to be on Sharp's general improvement. He has to be able to compete with teams that are now actively trying to compete with K-Corp on the early, right? If BTXL are going to have Markoon um, actually learn early game properly, that's going to be your biggest problem, right, when you get in later on, because you want to create a map where your, where your players can skill check the other players, right? And you can't do that the way that Sharp's doing things right now, because you watch enough VODs of Sharp and you'll realize when there are windows open, that won't be open versus other teams. So if Sharp just gets rid of that, then I think they're really, really good. I don't think Sharp's bad, by the way. I just think yeah. that right now, if we're talking about, and we are, we should be talking about this team as a team that can actually compete with the top two, 
um, then that that's just where he needs to fix and he needs to keep going. And he has a good attitude when it comes to that. Um, so just keep at it. And I'm pretty sure that they'll be competing with them by the end. They, they have a lot of potential, that roster. They really mm. do. Well, I know you mentioned Prosper earlier, so I do want to kind of turn it on to the UK massive <laughs> singularity. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's chat singularity then. Um, for me, my my standout player of singularity is is Fury, personally. I think Shocking. Fury's actually... What, what do you say, sorry? Bethany? Shocking, because he's, like, you... insane. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, okay. What a revelation. <laughs> I'm here for the lay perspective, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here to be your average 2 IQ viewer that goes, I like Fury because he's really bloody good. <laughs> yeah, Fury's good. And I like him. Um, but I actually also think Nolte's pretty smart. I actually used to didn't... I used to think Nolte was kind of like a eh level jungler. Mm -hmm. I think the more and more that I've seen Nolte, the better I, I've liked him. Um, and I think over the last maybe three splits, he's progressively got better and better as a jungler in my eyes and what in terms of what impact him and the team have been able to have. So I, I really like Fury, clearly. As you mentioned, he's insane. But I also think Nolte's really solid and Dragdar is definitely an up-and-comer for me. Uh, I'll let Orcs go first while I formulate this. <laughs> um, I think Dragdar's been pretty good. I think... Uh, I'd kind of like because I I don't think we've seen him on too much Kaiser. Like I feel like he's very like he's been playing like a couple of Ash games, which I wasn't too sure on because I feel like it fulfilled a role in the team. But in terms of like how much value there was there, I'm not I'm not sure. I was super sold on it. Like I feel like there's there's windows where I could feel like the team could be more aggressive and play around him playing something like Kaiser. But I don't think he actually plays it, which is like one weakness he has. But in terms of like his overall play, particularly on mobile AD carries, he's been pretty solid, especially when you know someone. I don't know who. Someone has been sabotaging his lane level one. <laughs> um, I think Nolte's been pretty solid. I think often he's been getting the ball rolling in terms of like play on the map. Um, it has I feel like they get bailed out a bit by Fury though, because there's definitely moments where Nolte will like have a strong early game, um, and you know they'll be making proactive plays, and then it's like the mid game will go a bit messy, and then it's kind of like Fury like has to one v nineteen fest essentially for them to come through. I kind of have a question mark about the top lane though, because I feel like. You know, if Prosper just stops making these mistakes and Wazel stops making these mistakes he's making topside, I feel like the team would be doing a lot better because I feel like sometimes they're weighed down by that, particularly coming out of the early game. But like Wazel's just like died for no reason and Prosper is just like ended level one for no reason. And I feel like if those things don't happen, it allows them to like structure their early game a lot better and they don't have to like bail people out when they put themselves in like these problematic situations, which honestly a lot of times are avoidable because. The level ones for Frostfire certainly are. There's, there's moments where Wazel's like super over aggressive and like flashing in to look for like these skill checks, which is just unnecessary, I feel like, for this team. So I actually really like uh, Dragar's Champel. Um, I actually think it's appropriate. I think Heist is really overrated right now. I think she's in a much worse place than she was before. Um, she performed really well when, um, when things that were good against Burst weren't so meta as they are now. Like Divine Sunderer, for example, is fundamentally changing as your Kaiser matchup. And I think that if you're going for a composition that involves something like Kaiser, the kind of champs like Varus, like Cogmore, like Ash, like Ezreal should be picked more. Like I really love that Hansama picked Ash today, for example. Now anyone watching the VOD knows when this was recorded. Don't really view the champ as a problem for Dragar. I don't view an absence of Kaiser as an issue. Um, it could be an issue in the future if the meta shifts there and it turns out you actually can't play it, but I think there is a good logic in saying that you're not going to be the one doing this, particularly given that it then enables your mid laner to pick heavy burst champions like Zoe, like Akali, etc., and you're not necessarily losing out on team fights with that. Um, I think... Um, so obviously I think Fury is really good. Um, I think he has some good early game systems, but I, I'm mostly just really impressed by how quickly he responds to uh, changing events on the map, how difficult this guy is actually to catch out in midsection at pretty much every point in the game. Um, and he just seems very confident in every champion that he's played so far, um, while the whole map is just going to shit. So <laughs> um, I'm really heavily in his favour um, overall, but I don't think he's necessarily on the level of like Febivan, who I actually do kind of agree with Excoundrel's rolling internal monologue of Febivan. I think Febivan is, is kind of like a bit too good. Um, but he has, he, I, I, I view him higher than I view like 
Ericsson and other mid laners that I've that I've praised to, right? Like if I was to do a tier list, he'd 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 be like A tier. Is this where you're about to come in and say, Budding Scoundrel, I'm about to shit on Nolte? I mean, Nolte didn't do anything at all that impressed me, left plenty of holes open that got Wazor killed, though Wazor is playing pretty fucking badly right now. Um the only player on that team that genuinely impressed me was was Fury. I actually think the rest of the players right now aren't doing so well. Um, I I do I don't think that the champ pull on bot was is an issue though. That wasn't to be make, mistaken with me saying the AD carry is therefore really really good. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean I think Fury's playing at an absence of everyone else there right now. As harsh as that might sound, that is honestly how it's looking. Um, do you, so. do you think Singularity are a bit doomed then? I, I mean, yeah, they looked pretty doomed to me, but I think Fury's probably going to get picked up if he keeps uh, performing like this. Or they'll rebuild we the roster around um, Fury. I have seen Nolte do decently in the past. There's never been a split, though, where I thought Nolte is, like, insane or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will say that, like... Um, Actually, we'll get onto that when you get onto their team. Actually, so never mind. Just go, 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 go on, go on, go on. Well, we've done Singularity, we've done Tricked, we've done Nordavind, we've done... Uh, Galaxy, Galaxy Racer, Racer and BTXL. Let's go with the other kind of clearly top team before we kind of move on to some of the other ones, which is Fnatic Rising. Yeah. Oh, um, not Granite. <laughs> uh, we'll come to that. Uh, um, Fnatic Rising, uh, a team that hasn't changed anybody. Uh, I think, for the most part, a very strong team through and through. Maybe some question marks on top lane. I think Pride has always had some question marks around him, though. Um, as you said, Febby clearly probably too good for nlc uh however I, I think other mids have challenged him well i do actually think other mids have actually challenged Febby quite well in the nlc so far bean and rux i i think i'm hyped on bean and rux though i think those that's a really good bot lane um and i i'm i'm not i'm not sure about maxi i'd have to get veterans opinion on that i, I you know these are there are things in jungle that i just don't see because i'm not i'm not at that level um but yeah fanatic rising they, they look like the best team in the in the league right now i think they've come from spring and have learned a few lessons and are clearly are clearly trying to have prove something this time around because they they kind of shut the bed in european masters play-ins they got dicked by xl in the finals so like they are they're clearly coming into nlc this split with a little bit more to prove especially for, Be for febby mm -hmm. um so i want to stop you like veteran what, what, fanatic rising what's the good parts of them where are the weaknesses that you see the good parts of them are the team fighting and the weaknesses i see are actually in the early game systems right now um okay and that's pretty across the board, um, including in bot lane, where it does, like, I, I wish I had pro view of them. Um, but for example, fuck, what was it they were playing? It was Ezreal Braum, I think they were playing on bot lane. And I I remember that just looking at the wave on bot and they had just been like hard shoving the first wave and they're looking to have to crash on second now. And you've denied basically one minion from the opponent, and this this has been fucking completely useless for you in general. And the harass that you get now doesn't really matter with them, and they're not really set up to succeed. Their win they do succeed is when Maxium Rux do find a pick around the skirmish, and they start snowballing from there. But these are often handed to them by their opponent's mistakes. Um, the early game is marred by stuff like this, that I feel like if you did this against better teams, that it's just going to get pretty heavily abused um another example would be like pride um pride on jace view and x and had like a completely free scenario to like not go for four wave crash but go for three wave crash um and maxi's parving was done with that in mind that he would have jace unlocked but he's, i think he just thought in in simple terms of maxi's going towards top side therefore i can slow push an additional wave but then he just gets like obliterated by renekton enemy jungler drops the camp to go and gank him and that's all open just because he made that decision which could only really be made on like a very broad based understanding of jungle rather than like a more nuanced understanding of the opportunities you actually have right now um these kinds of gaps are open pretty much everywhere except mid um and their response to that seems to be we have to play through mid and then go to side over and over again like i think their plan there might have been we play through mid and we dive top but then if that was their idea overall then they overall have a bad idea of early game so then that would be a place where if a team like btxl that was already doing well in early versus them um and is looking actively to improve early um like you said from the interview they're really going to suffer there um but mm -hmm. once they if if they get through all these early all, all these early parts fine once rux and maxi start making picks they just start winning right um they are really good players 
individually for sure. Um, so this 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 aspect of the game is more knowledge based, and that's stuff that is easier to teach. And so I'm more confident on them there. I'm really high on Bean out of all of them. Um, mm -hmm. Bean for yeah, me is a guy of an insane amount of potential. He's just mm -hmm. like unfortunately in the most competitive role outside of mid in Europe, right? Like yeah. I don't see any team desperately trying to get rid of their AD in the LEC in the future. Um, but I really like uh, Bean the more and more and more I watch them. I've, I've liked him since he was in Italian league when he was playing with Limit um, and I like him now. Um, so he's the guy that I think is like my player to watch from them. Um, how how Maxi is doing right now? I, I I don't know who who is making these calls and who is who is doing the setup for them right now. But like, if that is on him, then there is areas where he has to grow here. I think in fights he does find though, so there's still definitely potential there. I remember being really high on Maxi before, um, like last year. I remember really liking what I saw from Maxi, so I know he does have the potential. Um, but yeah, obviously Febben's still good. Everyone's still still good, clearly. I mean, as you said, I think he's oh. probably a cut above most. But I, I, I feel mean, like I feel like there's been like a lot of moments with Fabian where like he he's looked kind of I like particularly think like I know this was this was last bit, but last bit in the finals against XL, I feel like he was the worst performer on the roster. Like there were so many times I remember like an Oriana game where he was just wasn't connecting with ults, was getting caught out. I feel like he looked better at EUM, but I haven't. I haven't been hugely convinced by him, especially. I mean, I've set standards kind of high because the expectation is, you know, it's Febovin. Mm -hmm. But I feel like he hasn't been the star on this roster and hasn't been at the same caliber that I'd expect. And there's been like a lot of mistakes, a lot of times where he's like dying unnecessarily or like trying to force plays and then it doesn't go successful. I feel like there's been a lot of games as well where it has come down to Bean um, really performing these team fights kind of to to get them over the finish line when they they have sort of made mistakes in the mid game because obviously you know we've talked about the early game system not being infallible but there's also been times where like it's gotten to the mid game things aren't looking great and it's come down to like being really clutch in a team fight and i think febivan has sometimes been an aspect in, in things not going too well like, I, I really haven't been that impressed so i feel like when i've seen febivan force and it's being more of a flip um he's done a force in a situation where it could be really game changing right now, and the game itself has not been going well up to that point for things that weren't really in his control. Um, and he's basically said, I probably should be the carry, so now this is my moment where I'm going to try to turn this from a coin for the play into 100% play. And those things definitely exist, but I don't see him like throwing one games or something like that, right? I see him kind of trying to like get the thing that could get them snowballing. When, when I've talked to him in interviews, I've always got the impression that. He, he kind of feel well it's not even got the impression he did kind of outright tell me this last split <laughs> he, he kind of feels like he has to carry mm. because of because it is febby because he's in the, he's in erls and it's febby so like like he has to carry right like he's sure. it's his job to kind of crush any other erl mid laner and carry i'd um, be interested how much of that is like a gameplay decision that he has to carry and how much of that is like an optics decision where like if he isn't seen to be carried he might not get another chance in the lec or something I, if i was febby that would play on my mind yeah would that would that would that not play on your mind like you have I, to i think I, I, I think it is more an optics than a gameplay thing because i think bean's been doing really well as a carry and i think no. there's often times where febby is on a mage and like bean can, can be that primary carry like particularly when he's on oriana um i think it is more an optics thing because i don't think it's necessarily necessary for from a gameplay perspective, maybe against some of the harder teams. Uh, I mean, even even like BTXL came in the finals. I think there was moments where he was making it difficult. I'm hesitant to set veteran off on a on a side uh, a sideline here, but the the I I really do genuinely feel as a mid in EU optics do matter because the people that make the decisions don't always have the level of insight to see past pure optics. Well, I mean, they rarely do. Um, like, the people that end up making the decisions are going to be the GMs with the approval of the owner, and neither of them is going to be, like, an insane league player. So optics matter for, like, every role, not just exactly. mid, for sure. Yeah, but, like, in a highly competitive role in Europe, it matters a little bit more, right? Yeah, I like mean, if, if, if someone is being flashy in that role, and we are now in a point where there are plenty of playmaking champions, right? We've seen Yon, we've seen Yasuo, we see Akali everywhere. Um, you you have to also be flashy, or what 
gets approved is probably just going to be the flashy player and not you. So that pressure will definitely be there. This was also the argument for, like, why it's somewhat justifiable that Leader, for example, just kept going with his pool, right? I was literally about to yeah. link Leader to that point because I think one of the main reasons that, A, people were hyped about Leader and also, B, Leader get, get, got these opportunities is because he is probably the most optically visible mid laner yeah, yeah, yeah. that there is in Europe, right? Yeah. Like, he, he single-handedly... <laughs> dicked every mid laner at, at was it spring 2020 or summer 2019 which one of the two but there, there was one I european know. masters where he he visibly took a dump on every high tier mid laner's head and he made them look like they were bronze in the lane spring 2019 that, yeah there, there you go there, there was like the, that 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 you can't get more optical than that when it comes to like showing yourself as a mid laner and i think that's part of the reason why leader has been given opportunities whether or not leader can convert on those opportunities at the level of lec is still yet to be decided um yeah he he is in there on like a really good meta for him right now though but yes, when he exactly. was in um the erls and the meta was not necessarily so good for his pool he was still incentivized to play towards his pool because mm -hmm. why would you play on something that you're potentially right now b tier in or maybe even a tier in when there's something that you're like s plus plus your own tier in right why would you, mm. you but as a result this is the kind of paradox of the ERLs. You're kind of incentivized to scuff your development in favor of doing what already works for you because plenty of these guys are aware if they don't make it to the top four, they might never even be seen. And if they don't make it on the hype wheels, they definitely will never be seen. And that takes precedence eventually over expanding pool and expanding your, your development. Well, this is why it's important now to get off on the right foot, especially in all ERLs in NLC, but like... Let's be real. If you don't make European Masters, you probably aren't getting a shot at the LEC. So, yeah. like, you, you probably don't think. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of players very visibly understand this. Um, but what you do in NLC, to be honest with you, what you do in NLC doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Yeah. You need to do enough. You need to do enough to get you over the finish line to European Masters. Yeah. You just need to be in a point at a point, either gameplay wise or mentality wise, that by the European Masters you're ready to do your hundred and ten percent. Yeah, to, to hope you know, hope either that you help your team win, which is usually the best way of getting to LEC, or if you're two hours, you look like you're turbo smurfing on a shit team. Um, yeah, like no one remembered um, leader getting solo killed by the uh, Aurelian one soul one trick on AAA when he won EU Masters, <laughs> even though both things happened in the same split, and no one will mm. remember Prosfer absolutely sprinting it on Karma if he ends up winning EU Masters this split. Which he won't. I will so remember. remember it, but <laughs> I also remember yeah. no matter what. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's true. Like, it honestly does just matter where you end. The last things you do are going to be the most hype things that you do. Um, and that's going to be what you're remembered for. And that's all anyone's going to see. And, and even then, people won't even see the nuance in it. So if you can just game it, if you do just cheese repeat it, like what Sharp and Touch do, for example, could be optically quite good. Right, and that could optically get the attention of people because they're making plays. Plays happen because of them. Whereas what Jakey is doing, which is much better jungling overall, won't really get that, right? Because he's not doing the flashy stuff, right? Um, which is why jungle and support are two roles that get constantly misjudged, right? And the skill level of these roles is all over the place until you get to the point we're at now where it's literally an autofill role, right? So it's 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 a it's a difficult situation to go around obviously from a competitive perspective the system we have right now for how we hire and fire players just doesn't work and incentivizes terrible things but that's because the system isn't designed to give that it's just designed to give whatever's going to sell the most ad space for teams so yeah and you're not gonna you're not gonna you're gonna restructure our economy to save you know your erl player so just well, maybe yeah. consider that optics might matter from that perspective bring us back Febervin is somewhat correct right like if a lot of these flips do work everyone will just be like why the fuck is he here right and they'll be like that more than if he plays consistently and people will be like well this bean kid is also good as well right like that will happen so yeah. taking it a level further looking at the galaxy racer bot lane <laughs> 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 I mean, the Galaxy Racer bot lane cares so much about this that they're willing to get every bot lane that they've ever played up against into the LEC, you know? Now all of them are <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. All right, I've got a couple of the other teams that I kind of want to touch on before I, I have some ideas uh, kind of like towards the end that would be interesting to get both of your opinions on. But God, Sam, um, 
I I find God Sent really difficult to. I, I think Six Ten's kind of. Uh, I, okay, I'm going to phrase it in a nicer way. I, I don't I haven't been super impressed with Six Ten. Um, I, I think I think Yusa is pretty solid, but. I mean, as Orcs is making faces at me. Orcs is make, I mean, you know Yusa better than I do. Uh, the, the difficult thing with me for, for God's sake is I'm f struggling to pick someone on this roster to be like super hyped about. I mean, I used to be hyped about aesthetic, but I've been, it's been like two splits of just <laughs> nothing from him. So, yeah, it's, this this roster just is a little uninspiring and has been in their games a little uninspiring to me. I, good friends with Yusa, and I'm sorry for saying this, but he, I, I just feel like he's been sprinting it a bit. It's like, <laughs> there'll just be these moments in like the mid to late game. Like, there was one where, like, you can even see Zvene is, like, spamming his recall animation because he, he doesn't want any part of this. The pushing mid tower, Yusa just come back up a reset, and Yusa walks up to defend the tower. I don't know why. And then he just dies, and Zvene tries to help him and dies as well. And, like, that tower is gone. Just let it go. And then there's another time where, like, he's bot lane, and a rumble jungle clears out a warden tribrush. So he knows he's there. And then I think, like, Zvene lands a hook or something. And then he like rocket jumps in and then obviously Rumble, who's like a screen away, just instant equalizes. So he has to flash out and then ends up dying. And I'm just like, I, I thought you said like when you said debuted in the UK scene, I thought he was really solid. I think uh, he was a, he was pretty aggressive and often was like a big carry on their team. But like now it's just some of these plays literally are making my eyes bleed. <laughs> um, no offense, dude. Still love you. But yeah, okay, like, on the crossfire level one level. On the positive note, I do think Ace Fetic has done some good things um, mm -hmm. this I split. I, I actually do. Um, his Lilia game, for example, I actually really like sure. how he performed in that. Um, Kubu, is it Kubu? Yeah, it's Kubu. Kubu has also actually been pretty good. He's been an annoying fucker in fights. He's done this job really well. If your AD carries just sprinting out, obviously, there's nothing to want to happen from that. But I do think Kubu and Ace have looked pretty good on the roster. Obviously, there was a time when Ace Fetic was more hyped than he is now. Um, and that time was when he was on the same team as Zaze, Arome, Labrov, and Kazi. Mm. So if he ever wants to feel like he failed, he can just remember that those were his teammates at one point. Um, but he and Viking, who were both coming up at the same time, they're both in a position right now where they can kind of like prove that the story wasn't over for them then, right? And I do think that the way Aesthetic's performing right now, um, he's not, he's not, jakey and he's not maxi and he's not like any of these junglers and he's not going on the same path as markoon right but he is still playing quite solidly so i do have some hopes for him if they fix their ad and mid issues that they're doing right now so well you can see that i have uh two iq when it comes to analyzing teams because i chose the player that both orcs and veteran kind of shat on so uh <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, but yeah I I think I think when I I remember last split when I was talking about aesthetic I was still at that point where I was like this guy could be a big deal, um, but I think you mentioned like he's in the position to, to to kind of accelerate that. But on this team I don't see it happening not quickly anyway. You, you know like it's it's one of those things where it's sometimes it's difficult to really stand out on a team that probably mm -hmm. isn't going to stand out. Mm. Um, and so I I, I think God sent like. They they are going to be a middle to bottom of the pack team in NLC. Like that's that's going to be their role in this in this in this tournament. I don't see this team kind of competing with the top six really, and that's I, I feel harsh saying I feel harsh saying anything like that about any player realistically. But um, even with aesthetic, I I just don't see them standing out compared to the other teams that we have that are just. I just think better. And I think with the limited time that we have to improve, I don't think the six or seven weeks that we've got is going to suddenly turn Godsend into a top six team, in my opinion. Sure. I, I, I do think it is possible to shine on a bottom team. I do think that is possible yeah, to do. I mean, right. I mean, two hours in Jakey were examples of that on European Masters teams, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, though, they were like topping their region. I guess something that I would mm. compare it to that I guess everyone would know this one, like Alfari on Origin, right? 10th place team, S plus tier top, right? So obviously you can do it. Um, you may have to go for some flash, right? But you, 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 you can do it. So the story is not like doomed for Aesthetic or Kubu, right? Um, there's still a shot. Um, Granite, Granite has been <laughs> Granite's been an interesting team. Let's talk about Granite. Granite is the team that has won things that you feel like they shouldn't have won, but maybe is that 
is that are they maybe better than you know, we give them credit for? Um, I'm gonna I, I, I want to let Orcs do this one because he seems quite I'm, enthusiastic about it. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna I, I'm I'm pretty hyped on Babro by the way. Even if he's a bit of a jinx one trick, I'm kind of hyped on this guy. But I'll let Orcs hit me with your your spicy hits on uh, on Granite. I think Granite are better than because I think a lot of people place on like last place completely. Like I remember like seeing tier lists where it's like you have sort of the top four from last split, you didn't change the rosters, you had a lot of middle of the pack teams, and then like bang at the bottom was Granite. I think they're significantly better than that. I think their team fighting's been really strong. Uh and often they've leaned into it. I think it suits Babro as well. I don't think he's like the more aggressive AD carry role like we were sort of talking about Chris Berg, but more so similar to like Den Voxney where he will be able to clean up a fight when they've sort of come successful in it. Um I think Question mark about Wixo. I think Wix, like when Wixo's been on Alistair, he's been really good on his other picks, not as much. But like, I feel like when they, the thing that I like about the most is like their aggression when it comes to setting up the pace for team fights. Because I think I've seen a lot of teams where they have engaged tools, they have strong team fighting, and they just sit there and kind of like wait. And then the enemy team ends up engaging, they get absolutely wiped, and like they're just using all those like great engaged tools just to disengage. And I feel like Granite are a team who like really set the pace with that. Wixo, often on the Alistair, is someone who like will look for those initiations. Uh, I also think the top lane has zero has been really solid. And again, similar to the things I said about Zombie, he kind of knows his role in a team fight and will facilitate. The big thing for me was like having Teko and originally, I feel like Teko had a sort of like, it was quite a gank heavy jungler, which I don't think is too suited to this meta and the way he was doing it. It was like forcing ganks again and again, often end up like getting punished for it, but would sometimes set his lineups for success. I think when Indecision came in, it looked a lot more refined, and I feel like it was a much smoother process towards the mid-game. And uh, I'm pretty sure they won, won both their games when he came back in, including one against BTXL, but that, that team fighting just looked really good. And I, I see this a lot where like it'll be a team like Fnatic or BTXL, which has more experience, and they'll be like positioned in a way... I think this particularly happened with Fnatic when like Febivin was in his year last week. And like they'll be positioned in a way where like they're surrounding this team. You can see like Gwen off on the flank and stuff like that. And like Nocturne's ready to dive in. And they're just sitting there, like corralled in like a bunch of sheep. And they, they just need to like pull the trigger and engage. And I feel like that's not something that ever happens to Granite. Like they will start the fight on their terms. They'll have they'll use their tools effectively. And like even if the fight doesn't necessarily go favorably, at least they're like getting those abilities off. Whereas it seems some teams just like, you know, you'll have an Alistair who dies before he even uses a combo. Um, so yeah, I think I've, I've been really impressed with Garnet, and I think they are better than we'd initially expected. I mean, their compositions have two things going for them um, that other teams don't have, except for the one game where they lost. Um, and that is that they basically outrange every single team that they've played against. Um, and this wouldn't matter if their AD wasn't actually decent at positioning. So Excoundrel's not completely too IQ on this. Um, and then the functions of the rest of the team is to just try to play around that. Um, their mid lane on Oriana Sarah thing for a lot of that. And just play around the fact that the enemy can't really engage into them. Like, I do think... I think it's way harder to play into any of the compositions that they've picked except for the Kaiser one. Than it is to play those compositions themselves. Like, how, how do you play into these when you're locked into the Kaisers, the Akalis, Udyr every every game all this kind of shit right how 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 do you actually play into these compositions it's it's quite difficult to do um this is how you end up with like certain upsets that we saw in the lec were based around these kinds of massive range discrepancies and just a general idea that if you're going to commit to all this dive we're just going to commit to anti-dive and we're going to win on that um i think when it comes to alistair alistair's always going to be really good counter engaging those scenarios but trying to find a window into these teams is going to make any team mad, all right? Whether it's, like, Dusty or BTXL, right? Like, it's just so horrible to try to go into. Um, but, again, I think a lot of this is on the AD actually positioning well in these fights, and otherwise I don't think you're going to be able to, to actually pull these off. Um, I don't normally like talking about draft, especially when we're here, but Honestly, for them, there's being a big difference between theirs and a lot of other teams, including, obviously, like, BTXL, who they actually played against. Um, and I think it's being a pretty big factor. There, there are just some comps where you, you start playing against them, and it's all, you're already mental booming because you don't understand how you're, you're actually going to play into this. And I feel like they created that situation a lot. Um, so hats off to them on that. Um, they're being quite smart with how they are approaching these. 
um, mm-hmm. and it's working out for them so far. Just don't necessarily think that that will make each individual player there suddenly so good that they're going to like zoom all the way to you masters or something. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure if that means that they were unfairly rated, right? Because my question becomes, what happens when you stop having this draft difference? Like, what happens yeah. at that point? And people aren't coming in thinking, how the fuck do I play into this? Right? Like, I, I guess... The, what happens yeah. There? I guess the question is, like, do you think the Granite has got any fundamentals right or do you think they're just purely coming in with a little bit of well from what i felt from my perspective it's always looked like it's been really solid late game team fighting comps where as you said the range advantage is in their favor and they've just somehow stalled the game out to a point where jinx auto well, wins yeah i mean their 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 comps have really good wave clear as well the, the okay mm. the thing i'm trying to say is that they don't need to find specific windows to do stuff Right? There no. isn't a pressure on them to find specific windows. Okay? And if there isn't a pressure on you to find specific windows, you're thinking about the game in a much more lax way than any team you're playing against that's going for like the Kaiser compositions and the Akali every game and all of this stuff. Right? If they end up in a scenario where they do actually need to find the windows, right? I, I haven't seen them tested on that. Well, once mm-hmm. and they lost, right? Like that's, that's an open question. So I just need to see more games from them, right? Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that, that team's a monitor over the next few weeks and see how it goes type, kind of team. Yeah. I don't want to commit... Like, this is the kind of hype train where it's like... Um, okay, remember that? Remember years ago when I was, like, rating Misfits really low, but they won, like, all of their first games, right? Yeah. Um, and they got some giga good drafts there. It's kind of that situation because they didn't win again after their first weeks, right? So I'm, I'm kind of in that situation right now with these guys. I obviously didn't see, like... NLC tier list before, but if they were watch, if they had rated them low, and you are watching, right? Maybe hold because I think I feel like I've seen this scenario before, so maybe <laughs> hold, all right? But I hope I hope they prove me wrong. I hope they prove me wrong. You know, of course. Uh, now comes in my eyes the the, the well the team is the weirdest to me. Cova, um, they've they've had some. I mean, outlandish is outlandish. He he has some interesting jungle picks, um, and that's kind of I guess defined the way that they played. When we interview out, out, interviewed outlandish, his his take was: I pick jungle picks that have good early dueling potential. I duel and then I accelerate the game, which was clearly seen when he picks in Zal. I'm I'm not I'm not too up to date on Diana jungle. Maybe Diana jungle has those kind of windows, but it wasn't something that I would classically associate with Diana. Um, but that was that was his take on 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 the game. Um, what do we what do we make of Kova? That that's my, that's my question because it's it's difficult for me because they seem like a real oddball team in the NLC. Um, um so I they, I think Kova because it's basically the same roster so they switch mid laner. I felt last split like they were a team who heavily lied in like their mid to late team fighting to get wins, and obviously like didn't get a ton. I feel like that hasn't changed drastically, but. I, I I don't know whose necessarily fault it is, but I remember like this, like a bunch of instances where the team would be making plays, or you know the enemy team would be making plays, and it would just be like this is disconnect with regards to like where outlandish is and where like the action's going on, and like I, a lot of the times like it'd be so um, members of of Kova would be looking for proactive plays, like I, I actually specifically remember yeah, so this this is one I specifically remember. When they were playing against Galaxy Racer, I believe. Uh, wait, actually, no, wait. Which team was it who has Kakan on? When it, yeah, Galaxy Racer. So when they were playing against Galaxy Racer and there was that dive top lane, they didn't have the Dyna there with them. So, like, it was Lucian mid and Renekton top lane. The Orn had stacked armor. It was only two members going for this dive instead of three. They had a Dyna who would obviously, like, make the dive way easier. And, like, they're going for this play when, like, Dyna's on, like, complete other side of the map. And this wasn't like an isolated instant. I remember like other instances where like they're going for these plays because like they see a, a window, but they haven't set up for them. So they're mm-hmm. just like spur on the moment things. They don't have the proper setup. Their jungler's not even there. Yep. They go for them. They backfire massively. They fall behind. And then like if they are going to win the game from that point, they have to like out team fight their opponents, which sometimes they draft to give themselves those tools. But it's like such an uphill battle. Uh, it's it's opportunistic plays as opposed to any sort of game plan coming in, right? It's not like they've it's not like they're communicating 
one minute, 30 seconds beforehand that they're going to have a slow push on this wave, we should set up for a dive here and we should path accordingly for that, right? They're realizing there's potentially an opportunity to dive on the opponent, like, now on this wave, we must now react to that. That's the sort of thing that's going on there. And that's that strikes me as something that indicates that conversations aren't going well in, like, scrims. You know, in VOD reviews for scrims and stuff. And this is this is just something that's just going fundamentally wrong on the back end for them. And if you are developing based on opportunistic plays, though, that can be good sometimes. Um, that can be really good to teach you really, really fast. Um, but you generally leave that kind of thing for scrims, right? Like, I think we might be able to do this here. We do this now. That's not necessarily something that you'll do on stage play. Um, in terms of, like, drafting to get themselves, like, really strong team fighting, I honestly think that especially in the last game, they, they, they kind of drop the ball on that a lot. Like, these seem more like compositions where you'd have to be split pushing. Um, and the problem with that is that they aren't very good at playing as five, as Orcs is saying, right? These are a team that go opportunistic rather than one that set up a plan minutes in advance and everyone knows their role in this glorious structure of what they're doing, right? Which is something that, that Fnatic Rising, for example, is very good at doing in mid-game. Um, and if you're going to do that, you can't play a wide map with these champions, and if you can't play a wide map with these champions, then you're fucked, to be honest. Um, outside of the game that they won, where they definitely were set up for that with the Vladimir and the Jinx. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a team that needs to start thinking about the game as five, and it's clearly endemic throughout every stage. That, that It's obvious throughout every stage that this is an endemic issue. So... Yeah, that's that's just my opinion on them. Um, and then maybe they turn out to be good. But, yeah. Well, they kind of... I think they had the same problem last split. But because of their opportunistic play style, they, they were pretty good at identifying mistakes. So, like, even versus good teams, Cove would sometimes be really good at identifying mistakes and capitalizing on them. Yeah. But they'd also sometimes sort of incorrectly make the choice as well so like they always seem to like flip it a little bit sometimes that was the same thing they had last split and it seems to be the same thing this split where like they 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 they, they identify a mistake and they just go for it but often as orc said don't quite have the right setup so like they'll they'll identify a mistake but then they won't actually do the correct play around that mistake so they they, they clearly know the 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 as you mentioned, they clearly know the windows that they want to abuse, mm -hmm. but they never set up for those windows properly. So, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> when it comes to that sort of thing, though, if it's happening for, like, multiple splits, I just want to say, I don't view this as a play style. I view this as an absence of play style, right? Sure, you have an absence sure. of play style and a surplus of testosterone on your players, right? That's <laughs> what leads to the sort of gameplay that you're seeing with this team. Um, so... I don't know, these guys, someone needs to sit these guys down on a nice team bonding session, S take them to an escape room or something, you know, and then, and then maybe, maybe when they leave, they'll be like, hang on a second, are you guys in the game when I'm playing? Like, and then, and then from there, we can start having the glorious development of Cova Esports, all right, the glorious development. Okay, okay, so, like, veterans, quick fix for Cova, go to an escape room, <laughs> see how you feel on the other side. Taru, actually. True. <laughs> we've got another team, another UK team that I wanted to... We've got two more teams to cover. Uh, Resolve. Um, a team that's come up from the UK Academy um, and has some good players like Echu, relatively solid AD carry, and, and Soth, who I think is a good jungler. Um, I think Chimera has looked a little underwhelming, apart from his Anivia game, because Chimera was a bit of an Anivia one-trick. Uh, I... Can't really say much about fast leg. I, I again, I'm not, I'm not super clued into what makes a good support. So I'll leave that to you guys. Um, and then Caleb, who again, I have very little, very little opinion on just from as a lay watcher. Uh, I'll start you, you, with you, veteran. What do you, what do you think about Resolve? Like, what are okay. your takeaways from having seen Resolve play? I really like Achu last split, mm -hmm. and then this okay. split. Um, I've seen him overextend on a lot of plays that I don't feel like he should be overextending on, especially given that last split, I honestly did view him as somewhat of a modicum of consistency. So that was quite disappointing to me to see, but I know that this guy kind of has it there. Isn't he like, isn't he like 26 or something now, by the way? Um... I think he's quite veteran. I, I love, I love how we refer to old players as quite veteran. Uh, I, I, I think he has been around a little while. Yeah, he's been around uh, for a while. Exactly. Um, but like, I always seven. 
He's 27. 27. Jesus. Damn. As of a week ago. As of, oh, happy birthday, actually. You're shit. Um, but I, I know that he has the potential to be a lot better than he's been playing, at least in the last weekend, because the last weekend was the, was the games that I watched of them. Um, and he's always going to be the player that I'm going to look at the most there. Um, Soft's not doing too badly. Um, but mm. outside of those two, I didn't really note down um, anything on the West. So I'm interested in what Orcs has to say, and also what Orcs has to say about Achu on this. Um, I don't have too much to say about Achu. I think Fast Leg looked a lot better when he was on engaged supports. Uh, for the most part, I think like when he was playing Karma, he was. It kind of felt like they he. A lot of the fights, you could tell he wanted to like initiate them and start them, but they weren't finally engages. I think like that was like a, a, a draft thing. And the I mean there was a lot of mistakes from this team as well, where it was just like Chimera getting caught out or like fast like like recalling randomly for no reason as the setup for Dragon in vision and getting caught out. Um I feel like Soft was a little bit elo held so far on the roster. I feel like every early game it, like I remember against Kova, like uh he kinda got took a took a really early... XL, he kind of turbo smurfed the early game, right? Yeah, I feel like every every game he's Turbo Smith the other game. Um, I I can't remember which I can I can't remember which game it was specifically, but I remember one like he he completely. It felt like his earlier games were very much like you know control nearly game, making sure it went to a pace, and then I'm pretty sure it was um against I can't remember who it was against, but there was one early game where like showed up bot got a kill, moved around, showed up elsewhere, got a kill, and was just like completely chaining these plays together like taking control of the map. Then there's other games where, like, he will be playing more for the laners and, like, to, su to support them in that sense, and, like, covering them uh, when they need it. But So, like, I feel like he's really either held on the roster. I feel like an issue I have with Chimera as well as his champion pool, he's only playing mages. It was great when they had that composition where, like, they had the Anivia because it completely countered the enemy team who had, like, no dashes with, like, Siva Karma. It's also his one trick. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's like, that that that's a great moment when you're like, oh, we got Anivia one trick when it's a perfect pick here. For the most part, it's like, He's just, I haven't seen him pick anything other than these mages. And like, it, yeah. it's kind of kind of a bit worrying for me. So I feel like, I don't know if Camaris is not willing to pick them or um, whether he can't, but that's a problem. I think Fastleg, again, put him on those engaged supports uh, and have him pair up with Sophomore because I think Soft did so much by himself. And I, th I actually think Caleb has been pretty good as well. I, I think there was like, I think particularly like he was pretty solid, like, playing weak side i remember there was like a play where like he, he caught the wave in front of the tower and like froze it for a bit so they couldn't dive him i also remember another one where like they were looking to dive him he pulled them down away from the tower dashed back into it and then like fast like to turned up by that time and they managed to turn it around i, I think caleb has been pretty solid but i think soft is mostly elo held is my view my my lay takeaway from the games that i've watched is that soft is actually pretty good and yeah he, he, he often he often has the weight of his team on his shoulders going into the mid game and then they fumble in the mid game every time and that's not not entirely on soft it's on on a roster as a whole but every every game resolve seems to have played the early game has actually been really good they've actually generated decent gold leads they've played around neutral objectives really well soft has been the main driver of mm. a lot of those map plays and then they get to the mid game where some semblance of team coordination is needed and they run it down every time um but yeah, Sof is the best player on that roster by a country mile, in my opinion. Sure. Um, yeah, and I agree. I do think, though, that they do have a backup in Atchu if Atchu just gets back to form. And then yeah. I don't think the roster will be terrible if a meta shift moves away from mages. But like, I'm looking at uh, Camaro's match history here just in case I could find like AD champs. And he doesn't he doesn't play melee ones, but he does play like Lucian and Tristana, and those are still good mm -hmm. right now. Especially mm -hmm. now that we're in like the realm of Rumble priority and people are realizing Carthus is a champion. Um, and those are do much better. Like the itemization for AD champs is just better overall than it is for mages. Um, mm. And so if he could shift onto those and Atchu could get over this little slump that he has, then I think that they uh, do a lot better. I'm just going to take your word for it. That fast leg is just a lot better when we move away from Karma um, and onto more engage heavy supports. Um, and if true, then you have the option to go for these kinds of AP carries in jungle, pick something AD there um, from either Lucian or Tristana and you suddenly have a really good composition going where Atchu can do well and you don't suffer for it and Soft can be your carry, right? 
because this guy is looking like the best player. So why not try to enable that instead of sticking him on tanks and Olaf? Because you can only play mages on mid, you know? Like, it's it's kind of annoying. I will call stuff out for that, because I actually spoke to him about that, and, like, he... I don't know why he's playing the Olaf, because I remember, like, there was a game where, like, he, he, they, like, blind-picked it and then ended up into Udia and just had, <laughs> a, like, awful time. So I feel like draft is, like, an issue for this team as well, which... And they said he didn't want to talk about much, but, yeah, I think... No, if I mean, Kamara... here it's relevant because you identify Kamara's champ pool issue. Yeah. Like, so. I, just a last question on this one. Did Fast Leg come from the Newell? Was Fast Leg one of those players that came up through the Newell into the UK LC? And no, he came up with Resolve. He played with Resolve last, uh, last year. Yeah, yeah, I know he was with last bit, but I wonder if it, before that he was from the Newell. I can't quite remember, though. Oh. I don't think so. I remember he because he played in the UK LC with... Um, on a team with Yusa. He was a bot lane with Oh, Yusa. yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Um, that was last year, right? Yeah. Spring 2020, he was in with Yusa, I think, was, was when we when we were doing it in Sweden or wherever it was. I think it was before that. It was like when we had 40 champions in, in Spain. Oh, was it, we... was it LVP year that he was in? Yeah, yeah. he was wow. playing... That's I've time, forgotten right? the name of the, the Good team. Riddance, by the way. But I remember... Actually, no, was that him on that roster? I think that might have been Suggy. I don't know. It's too long ago. We've been moving on. He played for he, well, he, on. he played he played for London last split as well. Um mm. don't know that's relevant. Yeah, yeah, I think I got mixed up with Snuggly. I think him, I think him he and was Yusa the one did play together in, in the same team last split. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In resolve. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, it was it was he played used to play with Snuggly back on that roster in 40 Champions, so no. He played on a You know who I actually used to play with? Actually, used to play with uh, with Dan actually way back in the day, and I believe at one point there was an overlap between him and Caps being on the team at the same time. I might be a bit Ooh. wrong there because now I think about it, that might have been upset and Caps being on that team at the same time, and it was the same team. But then he just missed out on that. Um, but yeah, if you guys are gonna reminisce about random losses, I'm gonna reminisce about random losses. <laughs> Ahead, man. The old Mate, we're just, we're just League of Legends boomers at this point. League, League Remember Legends that XL boomers. roster that had Orcs on it? Oh, what a yeah, roster. Oh, God, yeah. Do you know when Orcs never shuts up that he won the UK scene? Hey, you gotta, you gotta milk it. You gotta milk it. Wow, the <laughs> UK scene. UK scene, mate. The height of esports uh, accolades. Um, last, last roster is Riddle, who... I'd never heard of MC before he started playing for Riddle. By the way, um, the third jungler, Kecht's obviously he's had a couple of a couple of uh, rounds in in the NLC. You know, MC, MC's a flicked, by the way. A flicked? Oh, okay. Now I have heard of him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, Gooby and PlayStation in the bot lane. I, I think Gooby's really solid. I think yep. Gooby's a good AD carry. Yep. Um, and PlayStation has has kind of been always on the borderline of being, uh, you know, a really 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 solid support. I don't know enough about slow queue, but for me, like the the strong side of the riddle map is really bot lane because Gooby's in it. So that's always been the, like the, the, what I've seen from Riddle. But they 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 also have had a pretty rough early start. They are where are they now? No, they're two and two. Riddle picked it up actually. Riddle picked it up over the last week, so they actually have kind of got they got their shit together. Um, we'll, we'll go with we'll go with you orcs first. Like Riddle, uh, what have you made of them so far in the NLC? Um, I think. Gooby's been solid from what I've seen on him. Um, I think in the 2v2 in particular, I think they've been holding up pretty well. Although there's sometimes where like PlayStation goes for these like doomed plays, and I'm not sure where where in the communication these are coming from. Like I specifically remember one where like so they, they had a big advantage in the 2v2, they pushed the wave in, Gooby reset and went for Cheetah Recall, and then PlayStation stayed, tried to like catch the wave so it wouldn't hit tower. To save it for Gooby, and then a flick starts coming along. So the, he's he, like, PlayStation's like, Oh, I guess it's go time. So they start this 2v2 fight when Gooby's not even there. I'm pretty sure someone else from the other team showed up as well, and then they just got like wiped. And I was just like, Why? Like, why is this going on? So I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, I think Slow Q has looked pretty rough in honesty. I think there's a lot of times where he's just getting caught out consistently. There's been a couple of mid laners who have like this tendency so far in the NLC. And again, it's only been a couple of weeks. It could just be like an early thing, but like there'll be moments where like you're in the mid game, mid to late game where spawn time's along and just gets caught out 
for no reason, for no good reason, just like in a place you shouldn't be. I don't know if it's a lack of communication between them, but it's like, um, that's problematic. I think Afflict is good when he gets the ball rolling. I think like he's, he's the sort of jungler who will go for these more like aggressive plays. I really like the one he did against, I can't remember which team it was, but when he like invaded on the Nidalee against the Rumble, I think it was against Sharp and he got like a really good early yeah, start because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was great. And like, you can see once he gets the momentum going, like he obviously can do a lot, but I also think like on the reverse side, if it like does start to fall behind, I think I've definitely seen a game where he plays as if he hasn't fallen behind. <laughs> and then that sort of snowballs a bit more and more, um, obviously in the wrong direction. So I think that's the thing with me. I think Afflict and PlayStation, like, sometimes make some questionable plays but also if like they get a good start to the game they can really keep rolling with it i don't really have too much to say about they're it. they're like a version of sharp and touch that you know never got like punished for their insolence as a kid you know like they they <laughs> they they don't understand no you know like that that's that's what they remind me of right now because they're not like tech they're, they're not like fundamentally foundationally insane right but they do just constantly go for plays and they don't yeah. understand that maybe the sixth time you try this in the far worse position than you were before it might not be a good idea right whereas sharp touch they have that similar tendency but it's like okay this time when monk hawks past all game all right but that's it's it's kind of the same issue expressed in different ways um and one is just a bit more passive than the other. I do want to say I think Kex is doing his job really well on the team. Um, I like Kex a lot um, from all of these guys. And yeah, I agree. Mid, mid's kind of inting right now. But yeah, it's it's first weeks. So maybe they can do better. Maybe. Um, but the team's in the, the team is in a, in a decent position. Uh, if you can take on Nordovin, then you're doing something right. Right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, so that's kind of like all the teams in the NLC. I, I thought it would be a good way to kind of like round out the NLC is mm -hmm. I, I'd like to hear, firstly, um, how you'd rank these teams from top to bottom. So if you would just pick how you think they'd end up ranking-wise from top to bottom. And also, if you were to pick one player in each role to form your NLC super team, what that would be. One in each um, role. Okay. Yeah. All so right. I, I'll I'll start because my opinion literally doesn't matter for diddly shit. <laughs> um, <Game> time. <laughs> so top, I think I just pick a Romo. I think it's like a, a sensible decision. I think a Romo is the best. Wait, the are best we gonna top. have like a limit, like how many players per team? Because I feel like that should probably be a thing. Like, uh, Mac, okay, max is two players per team. There you go. I made that up on the spot. Max is two players nice, from any great. individual team. So I'm gonna pick a Romo uh, for top. For jungle, I am going to go with. I'm having a look through all the rosters so I can remind myself. I'm going to go with Jakey. So I'm going to go Aroma Jakey. You can't just seek my approval this hard, Excalibur. Right? <laughs> no, can't. no, no. Uh, <laughs> mid lane, I'm taking Forbidden. Um, AD Carry, I'll have. I'm I'm a toss up between deadly and bean, but I think I'll go deadly. Um, and then support, I am gonna have. Oh, I think I've ruined it by going with two for fanatic here. But let's support. I'll have. Close. Okay, I'm, 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 no wait, no wait. I'm just gonna go rux. Screw it. I'm just gonna go rux. No, I had one for fanatic, so I've gone Arome, uh, Jakey. Aroma, Jakey, um, Forbidden, Deadly, Rux. There you go. That's my team. Okay. Who's going next? Me and you. Okay, I'll go next. So, so my position here, right, is that if I could get my... So, basically, what I'm thinking right now is, is there any such thing as, like, a jungle support? in this whole area that is actually like really strong that I would just want to take piecemeal, right? Sure. Markin and Advian could be that, but then I would lose Deadly and I would lose Aroma. So can I grab people to replace that? Or would it be possible to grab Maxi and Rux? And then I start thinking maybe Sharp Touch, but I think because they at least are doing something together, right? 
I do like what they're doing. I think the best play, then, would be to do Maxi and Rux, which doesn't necessarily mean that I go with, like, Rux as the best support overall, but I think this team would have the best place. Because while Prosfer keeps performing like he does, I don't think there's any question who the best support is. So, Maxi, Rux, and then Arome Deadly, you kind of have to take from XL, I feel like. Um, and then mid lane. I can't go with Feverman anymore, right? So I no, put myself can't go in that Feverman. position. So then I go with Fury. I go with Good. Fury. Um, I ah, okay. would. There was. There's a world where I went JK Tebow, and that world evaporated when you basically took as many players as I might take. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I've been creative. Just, I came at it from I, a in different my head, angle. Like, what would ve- what would veteran choose? And I'm just going to choose the players that veteran would choose. <laughs> would choose. Okay. Well, uh, mine is top lane Arome, um, jungle soft, mid lane Fury. Idi carry bean and support advien. I like your soft pick actually. I think soft in an isolated bubble is a strong player. So. Yeah, I think I think for me, like I think soft fury would be a really strong mid jungle duo. I also think advien's like done a good job of pairing up with Markoon, which as much as it's not like a pre-established jungle support duo, I feel like that style of play would lend itself really well to what soft is trying to achieve. I think Aroma is like a no-brainer. I think it's like impos- impossible not to take him, and I think. Bean would be like a solid option to round out team fights, and I think he's been really consistent, which I think is important. So I think he'd get so much space on that that lineup to, to flourish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, yeah, cool. But my I loss think... is the best. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, we're better, and I think whatever you selected would clearly come out of the best in this in in this podcast. I think it would I'm be. I'm glad. I'm show. glad we've established the hierarchy. There we go. <laughs> It's a good thing to do I, at the end of the I didn't come in expecting anything else, realistically. Um, and then, if we were to rank the teams from 1 to 10 based on their current performance. Um, again, I guess I'll go first because, again, my opinion literally doesn't matter. So, I put Fnatic first. So, Fnatic 1, right now. BTXL 2, I think that's the obvious one, too. Clearly. Three, Nordavind. Four, Tricked. Five, this is where it gets a bit muddy. Galaxy Racer. Six, uh, no, no, five, Singularity. Six, Galaxy Racer. Um, Seven, Granite. Eight. Res- uh, rid- resolve. Uh, <laughs> resolve. It's, like, it's between Riddle and Resolve. Um, eight. Riddle, because I just think outside of soft Resolve are not very good. Nine. Resolve. Ten. Dusty. There you go. That's my. That's my one to ten. So I would say. Fanatic. BTXL, Nordavind. I guess I would say tricked. I guess I would say tricked, but then I would say... I would honestly say riddle then. Uh, And then... Okay, the rest all gets kind of difficult. So I think Galaxy Racer EU there, then Resolve, then... Singularity. The last ones are kind of difficult. I mean, God sent Dusty at the bottom, and... That's just leaves Kova, right? So then, yeah, then that's the whole list. Wait, Kova and Granite. Yeah, yeah, Kova and Granite 
they're just above those two. But I do think that Granite guys should hold for their boys maybe being at the bottom. The guys who put Granite temp. So. I legit think I missed out Cover and Godsend completely. But never mind. Again, my opinion matters in diddly shit. Orcs. If you hadn't said it, no one would have noticed, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. Um, one second. So first place I have Fnatic. Second, BTXL. Third, Nordavind. Fourth, Trick. Fifth, Singularity. Sixth, Wait, fifth, sixth, Riddle, seventh, Granite, eighth, Galaxy Racer, ninth, Resolve, tenth, Kova, eleventh, Godsend, and twelfth, Dusty. Well, actually, I'm not sure about the Dusty. I actually think I could move Dusty up. I think I'd probably move Dusty up to above Kova. Actually, I'm going to take that back. So my last three would be Dusty, Kova, Godsend. <sighs> Oof. See you, Cover. Orcs coming down hot on Cover. Outlandish in tatters. <laughs> Orcs just stone cold into the uh, camera. Don't give a fuck, mate. <laughs> yeah, I'm apparently I'm cancelled. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that that feels like a good summary where the NLC's at. I, 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 my question now, because I've obviously veteran is is pretty good at doing this. Is I think to right. round up, which. Are there any players that you think people should be pretty excited about coming from the NLC? Like, if, if you were just to, to choose a few players that you think at the end of the NLC... To watch? To why, watch don't, why, don't yeah. we, why don't we go like a player pit team and see if we can agree? Right. Okay. Player pit team? Okay. All right, so BTXL. I mean, I think the... I think the exciting player for me on BTXL will always be Deadly, but I think you should watch to see how Markun and Advian go. But I would say, like, Deadly if I was forced to, like, pick a player. Um... Dusty, uh, I'll go with Zombie. Um, Fnatic Rising, I can't say Feathervan, so I'll say Bean. Um, sorry, Feathervan, you've had your time, old man. Uh, with Godsent, honestly, Kubu. Um, like, keep checking him. Granite. Yeah, I'll say Babel. I'll say Babel. Um, Kova, Outlandish, Galaxy Racer, EU, uh, Tebow, Nordavind, I think Ericsson is the guy that you should uh, watch them to watch, Resolve, Soth, I, I wanted to say Achu, but Soth, Achu will be back soon, um, Riddle Esports, it's either Kex or Gooby. I'll say Gooby, because Kex is old. I don't like old people. Um, Singularity Fury, that was the easiest one. And Tricks, I'm going to stick up for Madly again. Alright? All right, my boy Madly is going to show everyone the future of top lane in Europe. I agreed with most of yours. Um, that just means you're wrong on some of them, so... Well, there you go. Uh, BTXL for me, I think deadly. I, I, I think if, I, if I'm... Because I think Arome's obviously already shown what he's capable of. Um, and I think most people. I think Deadly's definitely the one. Deadly, I agree with that. I, I do want to say Arome because I think Arome's mm -hmm. still one of the best performing players on the roster. But I think Deadly's probably the better up and comer. Dusty's or Zombie for sure. I don't think anybody on that roster apart from M Test really stood out much. Um, Fnatic Rising Bean, hundred percent. Maxi's kind of already had this like looking glass put onto him whereas I don't think Bean's had that opportunity yet Galaxy Racer Tibor 100% Godsend Kubu or kind of torn with Aesthetic again but I've said Aesthetic like three or four splits in a row for that kind of you know role so I think I agree with you on Kubu Granite 100% 100% Babro 100% Babro I haven't seen enough of Indecision yet he looked pretty solid but I, I Babro 100% Kova such a difficult one. Last split, if you'd asked me, I'd have said Tiara. If you asked me last split, I would have said Tiara, but probably outlandish. Nordavind. I'm saying Kerberos. No one can tell me otherwise. <laughs> I'm saying Kerberos. <laughs> uh, Resolve soft. Riddle. Uh, I'm going. I'm going Gooby on Riddle. 
Um, Singularity Fury, 100%, and Tricked. I'm actually going to say Pulsum. I think it's interesting how like, some of them would have like three different answers, and some like you don't even have to think about it. It's just like, boom. Yeah, I was I was like the same Fnatic with Bean. Actually, for BTXL, I thought Advian, because I think he's improved a lot, and I think he's doing a lot more for the team now, and I'd be interested to see how he can develop from there. I also think like this poor pool in the NLC is a bit drier compared to like I think AD carry is pretty stacked in in the in the league in comparison. So mid team um, good as well. Yeah. Uh Nordavind, Kerberos, because you know, your boy. Um <laughs> tricked. Uh I think Dan Voxney has actually been really solid for a while. I think he had like uh there were definitely times where, like, he he kind of hit a wall. Like, I remember in, like, the Nordic Championships, he would, like, stomp everyone. And then against uh, Rai, he got, like, absolutely manhandled. But I think he's, like, overcome that and he's looking really good. Uh, Singularity, No Brainer Fury, Riddle, Gooby, Granite, Baby Raw, Galaxy Racer, Tibor, Resolve, Soft, Dusty, Zombie, Kova. Uh, I actually think Snoomy's, so, again, it's, it's kind of hard to judge because, like, the split, they just haven't looked good at all. But I think, like, last split, Snoomy looked really solid in the AD carry role. And I think it was him and Chara as a duo were really good. Uh, and then Godson, I think aesthetic. I think currently he's kind of like he's doing his best. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I I almost I almost said aesthetic as well for them. Like I almost said a lot of yours. Um, to be honest, it's it's quite difficult. Like I could have said Kobo and Lord of Vind as well. Just take any of the carries. Like I just think there's a lot of players that it's worth watching NLC for. So watch NLC. There you exactly. go, guys. Lots of good players in NLC. Yeah, and. We were in EU Masters finalists, so True. if you're not watching LFL, you should be watching us because we're second place, exactly. and that's the only metric we're going to judge you from. Europe always <laughs> comes down to England v France anyway, guys. Come on. We knew this. So. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, that's it. That's, that's, that's it. That's an LC.